See, much better than two and a half minutes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Welcome to another episode of Streaming Clouds. Uh, and as always, thank you for tuning in. My name is Robin. Uh, I'm a cloud solutions architect and practice lead at NordCloud. Kev, what are we up today, man? So, yeah, just a quick introduction for me as well. I'm Kevin. I'm a cloud solution architect at Microsoft. And today we are going to be exploring AKS or Azure Kubernetes Service with the one and only Richard Hooper. Richard. Someone's got their stream deck working. Yeah. Very nice. It's money well spent. Do you, <laughs> yeah. want to, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us what yes. you do and what, what's going to be happening. Cool. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm Richard Hooper, uh, also known as Pixel Robots. Um, I am working currently for a company called Intercept, who are based in the Netherlands. Um, I work basically with AKS day in, day out. Even did myself a little LinkedIn learning course, which anyone can go and watch um, on LinkedIn, all about learning AKS. We're just going to run it through tonight. Um, I just thought it'd be easier that way. No? Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll do it some live demos. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, nice, man. Oh. You've been uh, pretty active lately, right? Uh, the course came out when? Second uh, of June, the course came out. So yeah, it's going quite well so far. Over two thousand views, which isn't too bad. So yeah, if anyone wants to watch it, go search for Learning AKS on LinkedIn Learning and watch it. Give me a thumbs up. You get a nice little certificate at the end. So you know, win win. You know what? I'm gonna bookmark that and I'm gonna do that course because no doubt I'll be learning stuff that I've. Well, let's be honest, I've never even come across before. So I've, been, I've seen like loads of students posted on LinkedIn as well. The feedback's been positive. I think it's great. And, you know, it, you, you say to validate yourself, uh, it's mm -hmm. to teach others as well. So, you know, top efforts yeah. there. Definitely. All right, okay. So, so how do we want to do this? What have you I got can... for us? You want to share a screen? Yeah, let's, let's get my screen up. It's ready to let's... go. Oh, look at that, prepared. Yes. So as everyone knows, this is the Azure portal. Uh, hopefully everyone's seen this before, but if not, when you log in to portal.azure.com, you're greeted with something like this. And then because I use Azure Kubernetes services literally every day, I have it at the top here. So uh, I'm just going to click on that one. And I've got a couple of clusters I've been playing with, but what we're going to do today is we're going to explore AKS. So let's start off by creating an actual AKS cluster using the Azure portal. And what I'll do is talk you through the blades and then you guys can jump in and ask questions if you want to, or anyone in the comments can ask a question live and we'll answer it. So it's all good. So first off, obviously in Azure, you have subscriptions. Um, these can be like your logical boundaries between dev and prod or different applications. For me, I'm just gonna pick my Azure MVP sponsorship one because I have lots of free credits and AKS can cost a bit if you are not careful. Um, for resource groups, I'm just going to create a new one. You can pick an existing one, um, but we'll just call this AKS uh, SS for um, SC for streaming clouds. And then we'll click OK. And we get this cool little drop down box here, uh, which is next to the cluster preset configurations. And you have standard, dev test, cost optimized, batch processing, or hardening. But what does each one actually mean? Let's click on this little button here. We get a nice little table. So the standard one, if we pick this as a preset, so Azure, the AKS team have like created these presets to make the onboarding easier for everyone. Now, I don't agree with all of them, and I'll explain why in a minute, but the standard one, which is the one probably most people will go for, gives you the best of getting started to deploy production-ready application. So the key there, production-ready applications out of the box quickly, and it works with most applications. And if we look down here, we have the... DS2 V2 VM sizes for your system notebook, that's fine. Maybe look at the V5s for the bit of a faster CPU. Um, there's not much cost difference, so definitely look at that. Doesn't actually give you a user notebook. And when you're talking about production, this is meant to be a production ready uh, one. And if you're going production ready, you sort of need to um, have that worker notebook because your system notebook shouldn't be running any of your workloads. So why are they saying this is production ready when it's not? So keep that in mind. If you do pick this, it's not production ready. You should have a user node pool. Next, we have the cluster auto scaling enabled, which is good. You should always have that. As you can see, they tick it for all of them. 
And then private cluster, they don't have private cluster is good if you want that really super secure enterprise grade where it's only accessible inside your VNet and everything. But for most people, you can do IP whitelisting and stuff. So just keep to the uh, sort of standard one I would recommend, unless you have that really tight constraints of you know your governance and your your ISO audits or your security auditors SOC two and stuff. Next up, we have availability zones. So obviously in Azure, you have the availability zones, which are different data centers inside an Azure region. So like different cooling, different power, totally separate buildings. So if one zone goes down, your apps can still run. So when you actually deploy your workloads in AKS, you've got to make sure you use these availability zones. Otherwise, they could all end up on the same availability zone and your application could then die. So always keep that in mind. And then this one, Azure Policy. Now, I'm sure you guys know Azure Policy is a key point to go in production ready in in um, in anything in Azure. You know, your governance package is it's got to be spot on before you really go live. So why are they missing missing Azure Policy here? I don't know. They only for some reason put it on for the hardened access one. There's no harm putting it on now. You can easily put it on afterwards. It's just a tick box in the Azure portal or a simple AZ CLI command. But I would always have Azure policy enabled from the get-go. Next up, they have Azure Monitor, and they've enabled that, which is good. But be careful with Azure Monitor because the cost can go through the roof. So if you are going to use Azure Monitor, make sure you sort of keep an eye on the cost. And you can also sort of limit what it sort of logs into the log analytics workspace. So by default, it does your STD out and your STD errors. You can disable that. You can disable different namespaces. So you could say, I only actually care about the Kubernetes part of it. So I only log those namespaces like kubesystem and so forth. Because my application, I'm utilizing uh, App Insights. So all my logs go off there. So why am I duplicating it in two places? I don't need to worry about that. So you can just do it that way. And then Secret Store CSI driver, this is a way to inject your passwords or your secrets, Kubernetes secrets, into the actual pods as like an environment variable mount point inside the pod. So only your pod can access that secret, which is really cool. Um, you can have that on as default if you really want to, but it all depends on your applications. If you're using Helm charts from third parties, some of them can't utilize that. So that's why they don't enable it by default. And then the last one is the API server availability. And they're giving us 99.5% here, which I think is the free tier. Um, yeah, if we go 99.9%, .9%, you pay 10p per cluster per hour, which is like 73 euros a month or something for your cluster, which is really cheap. And you get that better SLA, so definitely do that. But we'll just go ahead and click on the standard one here, and we'll apply that. We'll take the defaults here. Then we we'll give it a name, and we we'll just call this AKS SC for Stream Clouds. I'm gonna pick a different region because UK South always has constraints, it seems lately. So we'll just go West Europe, and then we're gonna go down. And these are the availability zones. It automatically picks us one, two, and three, part of the high availability. You know, we should always do that. Next up, we have the Kubernetes version. So we have quite a few versions we can pick from. The default is always the one in the middle. Um, you have previous ones, which is 121.9, um, and you see we have like two versions of that, and we have two versions of the 22, and then two versions of the 23, and one in preview. So you'll notice we have three live minor versions. So Kubernetes version in is you got your one, which is your major version, dot 21, which is your minor version, and then your patch version at the end, which is nine. So AKS will always support the sort of last three minor versions and then the last two patch versions of each minor version. So that's why you see so many. And then they always have a preview one of the latest one. So at the moment it's 124.0, but we'll just go for this one. And then this is where we can change the API server. So we have optimized for availability or optimized for cost. And then we'll just leave it on the availability one. And then here we have the VM size. You can pick any size you want, really. Um, as long as it has like two CPUs, you're, you're good to go. We'll just leave the default one here. And then we have the no count range, which is the auto scaling. So we have the automatic auto scaling, which uses CPU and memory of your resources. We just leave this to one to five from now. And then we'll move on to the next section, which is no pools. And before I go into the no pools, any questions from you, Kev or Rob? 
I mean, if you go back to the the version numbers, yeah, right, it's a lot um, of information. Oh yeah, right. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into each one. I don't want to know the patch notes or anything like that. But what mm -hmm. would be your recommendation on? Do I go for the default one, or do I go for one dot two you know one twenty three dot five? What would what would be your hard and fast rule with? Okay, so being this is one of. This is one of the uh, answers where I'm going to use the classic IT term. It depends. And it actually <laughs> all depends. <laughs> it depends all on your workloads. So if you're right. new to Kubernetes and yeah. this is your first cluster you've ever spun up and you've got no other Kubernetes manifests or anything like that, okay. go for the latest and greatest version. If for some reason you're migrating from somewhere else's uh, Kubernetes cluster, like maybe GCP or Amazon or an on prem one, and you've got these API constraints, and your YAML 100% you know works with Kubernetes 1.21.11, go for that version because you know it'll work, and then you can test the upgrade path later right. on. Okay. So with, with AKS uh, and Kubernetes as a whole, each resource, so you've got your pods, your deployments, and all of that jazz, each one of those is an API, basically, and they have different versions. So recently... I think it was 121 depreciated the API for ingress of V1 beta 1, and now it's only V1. So if you have a manifest of V1 beta 1 and you try and put it on a Kubernetes cluster of 122.11, it's not going to work. And then you're going to be thinking, why is this not deploying? It works locally. Why is it not working in the cloud? Is there something wrong? So just match the versions if you're migrating. If you're new, go for the newest version. Right. So some, some good tips there, right? It's if you're new, try and go for the latest and greatest. But if you're migrating or you're, you know, moving it from on-premise, right, from another cloud service provider, then really, I suppose it's about uh, that dependency mapping, right? What what are mm -hmm. my, you know, my manifest files? What API versions am I using, right? So yeah, yeah. Let's, always got to be see. careful of those. And what I also have noticed in this as well is um, how much the well-architected framework, so. We talk about the pillars. We got mm -hmm. availability zones in here. We've got you know optimization for availability or for cost. There's loads of different options, right? And yep. I think you were just going to get onto virtual machine sizing, right? The power behind it. Yes. We were talking about that. So you said like go for the the latest version on that as well, because yeah. Cost so difference... I would let's have a look. Look, so the, yeah, yeah. the the V5s usually they're not much cost different at all. Uh, so the D2 SV5, that one there, it's not giving me a price, but they're usually not much cost different at all. Let me see if I can zoom it. There we go. So that's uh, 62.57, and the current right. one is 65.29. So the new cheaper one is to go cheaper. on the latest generation, right? Yeah, so. yeah. And then, yeah, the DS2 V2s, which is the one I think we are, is 73.99. So, yeah, um, I would try and go on the latest and greatest when you can faster chips right faster computer yeah, exactly. faster storage right and yeah. there were some constraints around iops and stuff from what i saw but that's not the storage you'll be using within your applications and stuff no so. exactly this this is just this system no pool and that yeah. you know it's just compute basically so uh it's all good but i'm just gonna go back to this one because i know i've got um quota for this vm size in my as your subscription site so would actually be able to build it. Um, I don't think I've got a quote of the other ones anymore. So, yeah. So I do we'll have a question, on. though, around the yep. uh, versioning, right? So if I'm on a specific version and a new one's released, um, how mm -hmm. do I? what happens when I want to upgrade to the newer one? Is that taken care of uh, for me? Yeah. Or? So in AKS, they have um, in the portal, you can actually go in and click an update version. But you can only go up to the next version. Uh, so right. if you're on... Which versions are they gone? Um, yeah. So if we're on 122.11, I can only upgrade to 123.5 first, and then I can update to 123.8 and then 124. But if I was, had an old cluster and I was on, say, 1.20, um, no, say 1.19, actually, because I've got some old things and I've not been good at looking after it and updating it. It's, it's working, so why touch it, yeah? Um, but I can actually miss the 1.20. So if I'm on 1.19, I can miss 1.20 because Azure doesn't support it. It's not in the list of available upgrades. And I can just jump straight to from 1.19 to 121.9. A lot of things will probably break because the APIs have changed, but you can jump 
only when it's a non-supported um, version. I, I like that though. It's like a like a guardrail of saying mm-hmm. just do like you know micro jumps, right? Because that's gonna, as we always say, right? The, the, it's, it's microservice architecture at the end of the day, isn't it? So you know, the, the more the more the more smaller the jumps, right? The more stable, the more reliable the systems. Exactly. Be, so. And hopefully one day Microsoft might even release a feature where it will scan your APIs you're currently using in your cluster and warn you before you update because you've got Azure Advisor now and it will tell you if some things are going to be depreciated and you're using them. So hopefully the next step will be they integrate with Azure Advisor before you do the update and then it says, oh, um, if you could do this update, you're going to break this, so we're not going to do it for you until you fix that. Is there any sort of... Sorry, Rob, go on. Okay, a rollback, or there's no rollback scenario. Not yet, but it's on the roadmap. So hopefully at one point we'll get a rollback as well. You can do snapshots currently of your node pools and your AKS cluster. Um, and then you can, if that node pool dies, you can recreate a, a new cluster from your existing snapshot. But it's not the same as rolling back, if that makes sense. You know, it's, it's, it's okay, but I'd rather have that rollback feature. And it is coming. Awesome. Cool. So the next one is node pools. Um, so we have by default the agent node pool, which is your system node pool. Always has to run Linux. Um, and yeah, it's running over these free availability zones. And by default in the Azure portal, it's 110 pods per node. By the CLI, I think it's 30. So just keep that in mind. You could enable virtual nodes where it bursts into Azure container instances. I don't see many people using this anymore um, because there was a few issues with that recently uh, with some security vulnerabilities, so people have sort of gone off this. But it's it's there in case you really need to burst. But VM costs are quite cheap nowadays, and, you know, with the likes of utilizing Keda, you can scale up quite quickly, and there's a new method. So when you scale down, before AKS would delete that node, that VM, now there's a way to deallocate that VM. So because it's just a VMSS, VM scale set in the background, you can actually deallocate it. So the VM's still there, but you're only paying for the storage cost because the VM's off. And then when you need to scale up, it just starts it. So instead of a few minutes, you know, three, four minutes, it's seconds to scale up again. So what you could do is if you work out your costs, right, you could um, like create a brand new node pool, scale it up to the maximum nodes you're ever going to need if you have costs for the storage. So keep your node images small. Then you just scale back down to zero. But then when you need to scale up, it's seconds rather than lots of minutes. So it's a cheeky way around bursting, basically. And it's quite nice and it works quite well. Oh. And then the last bit is the node pool OS disk encryption. So default is platform managed keys, but you can bring your own one. So if you're in a secure environment, most customers will want to bring their own keys and you can do that to encrypt the OS. But most of the time I just do the default one. Here, I can also add another node pool. So if I was doing a production one, I would create a user node pool. Um, I can have Linux. If I change the network and I can have Windows, but we'll get onto that later. You can pick the zones, you can pick the size, the auto scaling you can pick how many pods you can even do labels and taints all via the azure portal which is really good and you know with taints and tolerations you can say i only want my worker pods to go on to this one or if i have a vm with gpu i can say only the pods that need gpu will go onto this node pool so that's really cool but we won't create one now because you know it takes time we don't have an endless amount of time even though i could talk forever with aks um, so we'll just move on to the next screen, but we'll just leave these as default with the system one. And then we have the access. So this is talking about your AKS cluster, but also connecting to your AKS cluster. So the first bit, role-based access control. By enabling this, you your AKS cluster, your Kubernetes cluster will have RBAC enabled inside it. So you can use your rules and your rule bindings, um, you know, down to like namespace level and stuff highly recommend always do that i wish azure would get rid of this feature because you know you should always have your cluster with our back it just makes sense you know everything anyone who working in any field of it knows you should use role based access control by now so uh, yeah they should get rid of that and this last one is 
there's this thing in a in AKS called a like when you create a cluster without this tick box enabled, it will create a local account inside your AKS cluster. And this is a cluster admin. It's like God mode of your AKS cluster. And that's just anyone who can access Azure and has got the rule-based access control in Azure to the AKS. So owners, contributors, anyone can then go in as a cluster admin into your AKS cluster. If we enable this, we can set it up to an actual Azure AD group. So I'm just going to pick one of my many ones here, AKS admin. As you can see, I play with AKS a lot. So now anyone who's a member of the AKS admin group can become a cluster admin. And you can do things like privilege identity management for the group as well now. So you can say, no one's a member of that group. No one's a global admin in my uh, tenant because it's all locked down. And then if they want to access the cluster with a cluster admin, they have to PIM into that group for an hour to eight hours, say why someone has to approve it. And then they've got a cluster admin, they can do the troubleshooting. So always enable that as well. Uh, it just will make your life easier in the future. But after this, there's another thing you can do. You can actually enable the Azure AD. So I know it says here, rule-based access control. That's just the Kubernetes side. But there's another thing where you can actually enable the Azure rule-based access control for the Kubernetes RBAC. So you can control your Kubernetes RBAC via the Azure IAM page in the portal. It's really weird. And they named it very similar. But... Basically, instead of creating cluster rules and rule bindings, you can just do it all from the Azure portal. You can create custom rules in Azure portal, and then it synchronizes down. This is awesome because if you're coming from an enterprise, you're synchronizing your on-prem active directory up to the cloud. So you've got your, you've got your groups and stuff also be syn synchronizing up and everything. Those groups then synchronize from like Office 365 to Azure, and those Azure groups are then synchronized down to the Kubernetes. So if someone leaves... You just remove them from uh, your local Active Directory, and it filters all the way up, and they've lost access to the Kubernetes. If you don't use the Azure R back in Kubernetes, then and you've given someone access inside the Kubernetes, you have to then log into Kubernetes, find the rule they have, delete the rule, otherwise they still get access. So it's quite, um, it's, it makes life easier for the enterprises, is what I'm trying to say. I think. Well, preach, preach, brother, yeah. preach. I mean, I have this conversation <laughs> constantly, right? <laughs> Removing a user from a management group, right, or a user group is easier than having to drill down into any resource that you've got deployed and you're, mm -hmm. like, picking them out, right? I just, uh, yeah. yeah. Suddenly get this NTFS nightmare, right? That everybody just... Uses. Flashbacks, right? Yeah. 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 No, no rules for, for permissioning your users, right? And then, yeah. yeah, this person joined and needs the same rights as this person, so they make a copy of that person. They're like, yeah, I miss half yeah. of my permissions. How is that possible? Yeah, well... Mm -hmm. Your, uh, Being there. Yeah, your system administrator is making a mess. <laughs> that's why yeah, it's yeah. not working. Stop making I used to be one of them. <laughs> yeah, same here. <laughs> yeah, 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 but I was always, you know, and I, I always came in and did projects around file servers and stuff, right? And they will help us clean up the mess. Well, here you got an Excel sheet, right? Um, mm -hmm. I will give you the framework, but you have to do the work, right? And I'm not going to touch any files or anything. So, um this is not something you just sprinkle on top, right, of your cluster. No. I think you should enable no. this from day zero, but... Yeah. Tenant, tenant level, right? What yeah. if it's not enabled? So if it's not enabled, you can add it at any stage. Um, so it's fine. It's, it's like a, you do AZ AKS update command, so you can update your cluster and enable it. But you have to have this enabled first before you can enable the Azure RBAC inside your cluster. But it works really well. Um, and it's really good. I use it for pretty much all of my clus uh, customers, customers um, and clusters. I think the only time we don't ever use it is where we have like an API-driven cluster. So no one ever connects to that cluster apart from this API, basically. Um, so, you know, everything's done via an API. So we don't need the Azure rollback because that API is somewhere else. And, yeah, it works well. But always, it's part of my best practices. So I enable it on every cluster now going forward. All right. And your um, best practices are the uh, publicly accessible on your website or anything? Or uh, no. So my best practices are basically Microsoft's uh, well architected framework, but without traffic because you don't need that really. Um, I keep asking them to remove it off the uh, docs, but they won't because it's something they picked because it had support for Kivo integration. 
everything can do that now with the CSI drivers and just use Nginx um, or what they have got now. So hopefully it will change shortly is in preview. They've got this web routing ingress controller, which uses Nginx. Um, it uses external DNS and cert manager. So it makes life a lot easier to create your ingress objects inside AKS. You just put an annotation on your, on your services and it creates the ingress resources for you. And this is just an AKS add on. It's in preview. And it's gonna, I think, be a changer uh, for people starting out in the in in AKS, which will be cool, because ingress can be a bit of a nightmare to get right. Yeah, uh, first if you get your head around it, and then you yeah. can start implementing it, right? So, yeah, that's the that's the whole thing with Kubernetes, right? So, okay, if I would enable this on an existing cluster, it wouldn't do any, it wouldn't mess up my my users that are already present and everything. Nope. It just adds no, it no, it'll stay. It's yeah. like local admins yeah. and domain admins on a d domain joint server, right? Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Okay. Um, so make sure if you do enable it afterwards, go in and clean up anything you have and move them to Azure so it makes life easier. Uh, and now we'll go on to networking. Um, and basically, we have two different types of networking, Kubernet and Azure CNI. Now, if you are wanting to use Windows containers in your AKS cluster, you have to pick Azure CNI. Azure CNI currently in the main one allocates any ip addresses you could potentially use in your aks cluster so we had 110 pods per node and we had it scale up to i think five nodes so that's 110 times five plus one for the node so we need to make sure if we use an azure cni the ip address range we have can accommodate that and future growth so if we're updating when we update it adds a new node so all you, you need 110 IPs then to add the new node. It does the update on the existing one and then removes that. So you need that room. So when I'm doing Azure CNI, I always use a slash 18 to make sure I have lots of IPs. But not everyone can do that um, because they're yeah, working for enterprises and they've got IP addresses overlapping and they want to peer. And that's where Kubernetes comes in. So if you're not using Windows, you can use Kubernetes. And that's a software-defined networking inside Kubernetes and, like, you don't need to worry too much about your IP ranges on prem, um, up in Azure, even overlapping with on prem or anything like that, because it's all software defined. So it's all, def you know, it's all natted basically inside Kubernetes, which is cool. But because Azure CNI knew these limitations, they got this new version where it will dynamically allocate the IP addresses. And they've got this new version where it's going to let you do sort of a software defined. Um, IP range as well that's coming soon and they've also just GA I think is as well is bring your own CNI which isn't an option in the Azure portal but when you do it through the CLI you can bring your own CNI container network interface so like from Cilium or Calico or another provider um, with that you don't get support from Azure you have to go through the third party to get your support so just keep that in mind DNS name prefix, you can change that to anything you want. Most of the time, I just leave that the default because it just sort of picks the cluster name dash DNS. Traffic routing. So this load balance a bit. In If you do it through the CLI, you could pick basic. Don't. Always use standard because you get the actual features you need. That's why you don't have a choice here anymore. And enable HTTP application routing is a previous version of this web routing ingress control i spoke about but it's designed just for dev it creates you on like private dns zone with a random name and helps you get up and running really quickly in your dev environments never ever ever use this in production and probably never ever ever use it in dev either um it's my my tip there <laughs> um yeah um it, it did the job back in the day but hopefully this will be swapped out to um, the web application routing when that goes GA. And then we have security, which is everyone's favorite topic in the world. Uh, private clusters. So this is the one where it's all VNet integrated and, you know, it's all secure in your VNet. Uh, I, I only do this when there's a really high secure customer uh, and they really need it because it makes management a lot of work. And I'm a lazy sysadmin, as we know. So anything I can do to make my life easier, but still secure because we have the set authorized IP ranges. So I can just lock down the access to the API to the IPs that I need access. So like from my VPN or from the customer's VPN or 
um, my hosted Azure DevOps agents and stuff like that. So we can lock it down that way. Next up, we have network policies. And I've been playing with these all day, and my head's like, um, but basically, with the Kubelet ones, you have none or Calico. With the Azure CNI, you can enable the Azure policies as well. Um, these are basically like, think of, you, you've got your NSGs up in Azure, and it tells you you can talk to this, you can talk to that. Uh, network policy in Kubernetes is basically the same, and it says this namespace can talk to this namespace or cannot talk to this namespace. This pod can talk to that pod all the way over there, over this port and stuff. It's all YAML manifest files, but you can do quite a lot of cool stuff. Calico works with Windows as well, and that's a third-party one, but I always recommend to go with the Calico because, yes, Azure doesn't officially support you. They normally do, in my experience. Um, but you will get the benefit of Windows container support. So if at one point you are going to go down to Windows, you don't have to relearn a new um, sort of manifest file system to secure your workloads. So I always enable Calico always at the beginning as well, because once you've built your AKS cluster, you can't enable it after the fact. You have to redeploy your whole cluster. Even if you're not going to use network policies, enable it because at a later date, you might decide you need to use it. And it's, it's a lot easier to uh, just start using something that's already there than having to redeploy everything again. So yeah, always, in my opinion, enable Calico there. Then we have integrations, which is uh, a sort of new, newer tab. It's quite cool. Um, you can basically integrate with your container registry. So if you've got one, you can just pick one from the list or you can just create a new one. Container, reg container registries are where you store your container images. So it's like Docker Hub, but Azure's version, basically. It's, you know, by doing it via the Azure portal, you're basically creating, the, well, when you create AKS, it creates a managed identity. And that managed identity is given access to pull the container images from the container registry when you select one here in the background. So saves you a lot of day two sort of operations there. And then we have the monitoring. Um, this is, as we mentioned earlier, is enabled with the standard one. It can cost quite a lot, so make sure you keep an eye on that. And I would never recommend you create the default name one. Always create a new one because that name is not nice. And um, if you've got your governance set right, you probably won't even be allowed to deploy with that name. No. So uh, I was make just about sure to you say, <laughs> change that. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talk about enterprise scale, right? Or Azure landing zones, mm -hmm. it should be a central one already deployed. And that name, yeah. like how I, I, I remember, right? Working, what we talked about four or five years ago, they were everywhere, right? You got a workspace, mm -hmm. right? Free with your with your Big Mac, right? Basically. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, you just yeah. have all these different workspaces all over the place and nobody knows what they do. So Yeah. So um just create a new one and call it something nice like um AKS SC long analytics workspace or something like that. You know, whatever fits your name is standards, just do one. Then we have this new thing called user managed identity, which apparently is in preview. Um it's not. I don't know why they call, say that's in preview unless they're talking about Nope. Okay. Yeah, that's not in preview. I don't know why it still says preview. Uh, that's just to use your user managed identity to talk to the uh, log analytics workspace instead of using like service principles and that. And then we have Azure policy, which I think should always be enabled as part of this standard configuration. I passed the feedback on. Yes, it's just a tick box after the fact, but let's make life easier for ourselves on the day two. We've got enough to deal with, so get it right first. And then we have the advanced section, which is a bit lacking at the moment. Hopefully, we'll get some more stuff soon because that, uh, that's a lot of white space. It reminds me of GKE at the moment because of the <laughs> amount of white space. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a little private joke we had previously. Uh, Shots but yeah. Fired. Yeah, <laughs> GKE is nice, <laughs> but I, I prefer AKS over any other provider of Kubernetes. But yeah, um, enable secret stores. So this just it lets you inject the secrets into it. This um, creates some daemon sets inside your your workloads inside your AKS cluster. Um, but we'll just leave that off for now because you know time constraints and that. Hopefully, at one point we'll get more features here, like enable key to Dapper. Uh, GitOps and stuff like that will be tick, tick boxes, hopefully, at one point, which will be nice. 
And then this tags, we just skip secret, over that. Oh, yep. Sorry, man. This this secret C, C, uh, CSI. Oh, it sounds really yep. secretive, but uh, yep. the the driver that is for integration with Keyval, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, it can this version, uh, it, the AKS add-on version, works only with Keyval. But if you install it from like the Helm repository from like uh, GitHub. You can link it with HashiCorp Vault, uh, AWS, GKE Vault, um, you know, all these different vaults. But this will literally, yeah, synchronize with, I say synchronize, it's not really synchronizing unless you enable auto rotation, but it will pull your secrets from your key vault down. Even your TLS certificates can be pulled down from key vault into your Nginx ingress pods as well. So if you've got a wildcard certificate, you can actually pull that down, set it as your default certificate, and it's all good. Um, but yeah, I use this a lot. There's um, a blog post going around saying, do we really care about your Kubernetes secrets? And it's like saying, most people say having a secret inside Kubernetes is bad because it's just base 64 encoded, yeah? But if you lock it down enough, how bad is it? Because no one should be able to get into your cluster unless there's they've cracked your Active Directory or your Azure AD. And then if that's the case, you've got bigger issues than someone knowing a connection string or something because they got the God mode of Azure and they can then just go in and reset your password for the SQL or something else, you know? So, uh, and then when we enable the CSI, if they're already in your cluster and they could see your secrets anyway, then they probably got access to your pods and they can exec into your pods if you haven't set your policies up right. And then from there, they can just get your secrets. So how secure really, you know, do you really need to worry about securing your secrets? They're going to be on the cluster at one point anyway. And with AKS, you can actually now encrypt your KMS, your um, your etcd with a key vault KMS. So those secrets are going to be encrypted at rest anyway. So, you know, it's one of those. Some people agree with it. Some people don't. I'm on the fence at the moment because I really like this tool. Um, but, yeah, that, that's just me. Uh, it, it's one of those ones that gets your brain thinking because – We've been drilled in, secret, key, Kubernetes secrets are bad, don't use them. But then you have these third-party applications like Kido or other tools um, which need to have a Kubernetes secret because you know, it, it will not work without a Kubernetes secret because it needs to inject it as an environment variable. Now, we could re-architect their application and say, actually, you can read that secret from this location inside the pod instead that's a lot of work and then who's going to maintain that because your developers or your ops people are already so busy so having the secret already in the cluster is fine maybe i don't know we'll see what the uh, community says on that one at one point i guess that's a refreshing yeah. way of looking at it right because everybody goes bananas about secrets and then you yeah. well try to spin up an enterprise Enterprise scale HashiCorp Vault cluster, right? Good luck mm -hmm. with that one. Yep. Right? So you add all these bells and whistles and all this complexity because you don't want to expose your secrets or you don't want mm -hmm. to put your secrets in the cluster, right? Well, your cluster should be locked down anyway because what you just said, if somebody has access to your, well, jewels within your cluster, then you have bigger issues to worry about, right? You're also mm -hmm. not doing a lot of crazy stuff with your, you know, important business related files, right? Your Excel yep. sheets and whatnot, right? Because exactly. they're accessible on the file shares as well. And the only boundary usually is authentication and authorization, right? The same as in your Kubernetes cluster. So, oh, well, it's an interesting one. I think we can talk, yeah, yeah. talk a lot I about that one. I think you could do a whole session on that. But, but whiteboard um, that, right? Literally, yeah. I'm trying to think of all the different scenarios, but I'm just like, no. no. <laughs> it's late in the day. Don't spend the evening no. thinking about that. No, 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 no. You know, this, Internet. I was mess, messing around with different ways. You have uh, MOPS, MOPS from Mozilla, right? If mm -hmm. I don't yep. fuck it up right now. Um, yep. that's, that's the one that you can, um, you know, ha hash or encrypt basically your secrets and put them in Git and, mm -hmm. and then use a, a, a key that's located up in a vault that you can use to decrypt it on deployment and everything, right? Yep. So then you can submit your secrets to GitHub. That's the thing that it's debatable. Even if you have a private repository, I don't think you want to be doing that, right? So no, I think no. that's that's the boundary at least. But secrets in your cluster, 
in my book at this point, based on our discussion and everything that I did around it, is perfectly fine. Yeah. See, the way you can think about it is you can store your secrets in Key Vault, and then via your deployment methods, you know, be it Azure DevOps or something, in, I'm not talking about GitOps here because it wouldn't work very well with GitOps, but you can create a PowerShell script or a Bash script that gets the secrets out of Key Vault, creates your Helm chart or your manifest file based off of those, and then those secrets only live for that short period of time whilst it's doing a deployment and they're secure up in your key vault. They're, they're living in the small window where it's doing the deployment, creating the manifest files or doing the hound deploy. And then they're secure in your cluster because you've locked it down. What I do with Azure DevOps is I run the agents inside my Kubernetes cluster as well. So I'm not using hosted agents. So I know if I pull a secret down, it's all fine because they're in my cluster. I use Keda to scale them up from, they're basically jobs, Kubernetes jobs. So if there's a, a queue in my Azure DevOps, it will spin up a pod, run that pipeline, and then delete that pod afterwards. So I know it's a minute, two minutes that there's somewhere with a password in you know semi plain text, um, but it's all locked down inside my cluster. So it's fine, but that, that's just me. Yeah. Yeah, and then it ends up in a pod in in a way as a variable or a file mm -hmm. or in memory maybe depending on on the configuration of the application and yeah. then you know it, it just lives there just as a, any other application so uh, well uh, yeah lots to think about mm -hmm. um but yeah and then we can just go back on to here we go the last bit Exciting probably the tags yeah, yeah. <laughs> so most people will just forget this and click review and create but you should probably always do some tags um you know you could do deployed by and then you put your name in there or whatever you, you whatever your tagging is always tag it don't just do what everyone does and forget it and just ignore it and then at the end we just do the review and create it will validate everything hopefully we haven't timed out or anything and the validation has passed which is nice and then we just click create and now i've got a in a way, a more secure cluster than I would have if I just followed the baselines. Um, not quite production ready because I didn't do the extra workload, usable and everything, but it's that simple to sort of get started with AKS. You know, we just gone through the Azure portal in 40 something minutes and we've now got a cluster which is at least ready for dev. Um, a few tweaks and you could get that ready for production. Don't ever do it like this for production. Do it as bicep. And Kev did an awesome video about the bicep accelerator landing zone wizardy thing. Um, so go check that out if you haven't. I think you did that with Johnny Chips, didn't you? I did, mate. Yeah, I've got the link yeah. here. Ah, even better. I, I um, I'll be honest. Really great, really powerful. Developed and spearheaded by uh, Gordon Byers. I don't know. Follow him on Twitter, Twitter, right, and LinkedIn. This guy. Takes automation to a new level, right? I wish I was, I wish I had mm. half the knowledge that Gordon had, right? But yeah, I think we were talking about this with Brendan as well. It's still good to go through the portal mm -hmm. and break it down, right? Before you hit the bicep, before you hit the terraform, right? Whatever it is, yep. whatever your poison is, because you've still got to wrap your head around the, the concepts and, and the options and just seeing those radio buttons and drop down menus just makes that a little, little bit easier sometimes, right? To get your head around. Yeah, so. definitely. And, and like, like they always say, you know, a GUI is so much easier on the eyes as well. You know, we're, we're well, I'm a sysadmin. I think Kev's a sysadmin. I don't know if Rob was a sysadmin or not or a developer. Yeah, it's sysadmin. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> we're all used to point and click. So for us to get our head around this complex thing called Kubernetes, having something like this it makes our life so much easier because we can now go in depth into each section you know there's the little eyes to tell you a bit more about each bit as well and then from here well for me personally I, you know when i first started with aks it was a point and click adventure and now i can do it in bicep terraform i know inside out you know i could just talk about aks all day every day now um and when Kubernetes came out, it was de designed for, well, they say it was designed, marketing said it was designed for developers to make sysadmins, you know, not have to do anything anymore. But really, I'm finding it's a sysadmin tool to assist developers get their code out quicker, more than anything. So with Kubernetes as a whole, people say it's very complex. 
and it is in a way, but it's not the technology isn't actually complex. It's because you've got networking to think of, you've got application packaging to think of, you've got security, role based access control, patching, updating, everything the sysadmin used to do back in the days of looking after IIS servers and packaging your MSI files with MSTs, transforms, and stuff. So we've got that knowledge already there. It's just a different name in Kubernetes. So how complex is it really? Not that complex if you've been a sysadmin and you can just sort of figure out, actually, a container image is just an MSI. Uh, the environments are just an MST. You know, it's that simple, really. But yeah, the networking is probably the hardest part. I hate networking. <laughs> Networking's a black art, right? And uh, yeah, I love networking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like oh, it's like yeah. that that itch you can't scratch. That's what I like mm -hmm. about networking. But yeah, you know all the stuff you were mentioning before. You know, DNS is a major part, right? If Kubernetes getting mm -hmm. that right, and then you've got all the, the magic and wonder, right? Of man, you know, preparing your network. You know, the amount of conversations I have with customers around about. So let me talk about your IP management, and I get that. <laughs> thousand yard stare right i said please tell yeah. me you've got an excel spreadsheet with some stuff in just that, even that as a bare minimum right as an ipam mm -hmm. so for folks that don't know what an ipam is it's ip address management right you can get mm -hmm. some fancy appliances that can do it for you on premise i believe but uh yeah the excel yeah, spreadsheet's still good enough right yeah. for most people so definitely that sort of reminds me of sitting the windows server exams because they always had the ipam built in no one yeah. ever used it because they had the spreadsheets nope. but you <laughs> used to get so many questions on it it was a yeah. nightmare was the uh, one of the features you could enable within windows server right so yeah you could do your yeah. yeah yeah ip addressing in there but at least being aware of your subnets and and don't create any overlapping subnets yeah. um mm -hmm would uh, benefit your routing, right? Otherwise, you, you're going to have an issue. Am I going left or am I yeah. going right, right? I got two times the same exactly. network. It's, uh, no, I love well, no, another top tip I would say as well is if you don't need to ever connect your AKS cluster to any of your other networks, don't, because you're just increasing that attack vector, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the, the what is it, the east-west traffic and stuff. So That's just right. if, right, if, you yeah. cannot, if you cannot connect it to anything else, don't. You know, let it be a standalone system on its own. Think of it in its own little DMZ. Look at me with all my networking terminology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just, Go on. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. leave it alone, basically. So set it aside. Don't connect it to anything unless you really, really need to. I would love to highlight that because everybody always comes up with the most complex things because we can and it needs to be connected and this and that. I'm in the middle of workshops with a customer. Probably if they listen, they know it's them, but... Mm -hmm. um the, we're, we're deploying a, a landing zone right a foundation mm -hmm. and they want to interconnect they got like all three major cloud platforms and they oh, want to yeah. already interconnect everything and i'm challenging them i'm like why why yeah because mm -hmm. this and that and everything needs to go there and everything needs to be publicly accessible now you're private accessible and we need to block the pri public apis and this and that and they're trying to replicate like the old school quote unquote data data center approach, right? And not mm -hmm. necessarily the, the the cloud native approach of um, exactly. you know building th building things out. And so then by default you 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 start with this whole Christmas tree that you probably don't need, right? And then if something doesn't work, try to wrap your head around that and try to troubleshoot it. Right. And the same is with Kubernetes. I think the, the more you can trim it down, you know, keep it mm -hmm. as slim as possible, it would benefit management and, and everything greatly right yeah yeah definitely uh, definitely like every, all these landing zones you see now have hub spoke technologies and stuff that spoke doesn't ever need to be attached to that hub it, you know it can be a later date if you really really need to but you shouldn't have it from the beginning in my opinion uh, you know you've got bastion and people say oh but i need to access the aks nodes with bastion do you really, do you ever really want to even touch the AKS nodes? They're, they're ephemeral, you know, just delete them and create a new one. It's fine, you know. You don't need to really ever troubleshoot an AKS node to find out what's going wrong because you can just throw it away. It's this mindset change that we need to get people to understand, I think, as well. Uh, same with, with like customer managed encryption keys, right? Only use them mm -hmm. when you really need to because you need your exactly. own PKA infrastructure yeah. and all that stuff to manage these certificates that you use for your infrastructure, right? Just let mm -hmm. Azure manage whatever you can. It's, uh, yeah. 
Department of Defense scenarios, right? Or Ministry of Defense scenarios, or that kind of thing. Or air and, gap yeah. clusters and whatnot. Or, or, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, fi- you know, Bank of England kind kind, kind of jobs, right? But yeah, um, it's. Uh, I think it's more of a trust thing. It's a confidence thing, right? And if you've got mm-hmm. new customers, I think it's alleviating that. And I'm, you know, we were talking about hub and spoke there, right? And yes, you know bringing that traditional mindset but i think it is more about i'm going to go into sales mode here but the journey (laughs) so you know it's 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 the different stages right yeah it's the different stages right Yeah, yeah yeah But yeah, uh, back to the AKS cluster. Um, it's deployed and it's here. And then from here, we have these Kubernetes resources section where you can actually see nice. your workload. So this is like the old AK, uh, the Kubernetes dashboard. They've incorporated it into Azure now. And with that RBAC stuff, you can actually enable who can see this in the Azure portal as well. So it listens to that RBAC. And so if Kev connected to my uh, tenant, if you know if he had a user, and I didn't give him permissions to see anything in my Kubernetes. He could go and see, you know, the overview page and what, but he couldn't see the workloads because of the RBAC, which is really cool. Um, yeah, that, that's really all I was going to walk through at the moment is the, the the steps to sort of create a cluster, get started with it. And I, I suppose the last thing I should probably mention is this create button at the top. Um, and what you can do is they've got this starter application now as well. So you can just click on that. And then you can create a basic web application or a single image application. So you could just do one of these two. And then again, tick boxes um, come up and you can just sort of, well, not tick boxes on this one, but yeah, you can just fill in all of this or see the YAML, it creates it for you. You can click deploy and then it deploys all of those resources for you. And then it waits for it to be available and then you can just do a bit more stuff and it's really cool just to get yourself going. It gives you the basic vote uh, application that everyone's probably seen. So it creates cats and dogs space. or something like that, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I can just click view application, and then hopefully, if it's all worked and everything's fine, we should get the cats and dogs vote app. Do you, do you know what I liked about that little wizard? Then there was a uh, the YAML example. So, oh yeah, you can know what good looks like, right? So yeah, exactly. You know, you know, if you're starting out, you're trying to figure out, like, your... you know, we've got all the quotas there. Yeah, what, how much power it's got, you know, and, and mm-hmm. connection ports. It's a good place to start. You know? Yeah, it's got everything you sort of need to get going. Um, and yeah, we've got the cats and dogs, and uh, it's probably always cats for me. Um, always cats. So yeah, that, that's it really. That's that's sort of how to sort of get started with AKS and uh, yeah. Um, it's I find it a lot easier than it used to be, um, which is nice. It's, to, it's really come on. It's been a while since I've done it in the portal because I, I use the bicep accelerator, right? Or, um, you know, trying to, trying to churn it out via infrastructure as a code, but it's, mm. yeah, it's, it's, it's getting really mature. I mean, it's the right word, like all the different yeah. options and all the different features. And I'm really glad to see all the well-architected framework elements in there, you know, um, compared to other resources that may be in Azure, like from an experience point of view, like this is built in as part of the decision-making, which is really good to see. Yeah, definitely. It's improved so much. I remember back when it was like Kubernetes 1.11 or something when I first played with it, it was was not the best, but they put a lot of effort and they just seem to keep pushing new changes and new changes all the time which is good to see uh, i see awesome a couple source. of awesome things next to settings or underneath settings right oh, yeah. service GitOps. Managers, GitOps, yeah, deployment yeah. center yeah. that's probably canary canary based rollouts and whatnot right and yeah policies. you can look in with azure um github or azure repos and all your git source control and from there you can then create your pipelines um into your cluster you got the GitOps, which is really cool. I could do a whole video about GitOps. Um, that's basically you pull your, instead of pushing your configuration to the Kubernetes, it pulls it from Git. And uh, so your Git is your single source of truth and it just constantly reconciles against that and make sure your cluster is exactly as you want it to be. So if Kev went into my cluster, changed uh, the replicas of my vote backend to four instead of the two that I had in Git, it would, five minutes later, it would fix that for me, which is really cool. 
Um, yeah. Desired Sorry, state, right? No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's a story yeah. of my life. I'll be quite honest. But uh, no, I like that. Like this, this side, this uh, desired state. So mm-hmm. we've got what's actually reality. And then we're using GitOps for observability. And then actually, you know, that, <laughs> that's what I wanted, right? And getting yeah. it deployed, which is really good to see because that, that's where everything's moving. Everyone's been talking about DevOps, right? For mm-hmm. God knows how long. But now I'm starting to have conversations it's like, yeah, it's like a, there's a new kid on the block and actually yeah. you should be trying to do this. Right? Yeah. So. But but the funny thing is you call it a new kid on the block, but it's we've had PowerShell, while, right? desired state configuration and other desired state configurations for a long time in the sysadmin world. It's just becoming cloud native. Uh, it's the same principle, but you instead of having it as uh, some a folder in your file server, it's now yeah. in a Git repository instead. You know, it's that's right. The same principle, but it's just called GitOps now. Fancy new name. But yeah, and, and then you yeah, do, other... uh, you know, if you do DevOps the right way, then Git is your only source of truth. Of, you know, your source of truth as well, right? It only mm-hmm. it doesn't declare or remediate like uh, you know configuration drift or anything like that because it's more of a out. Uh, outside in approach instead of an inside out uh, in inside out approach yeah it's getting late <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah too right but yeah no um they've just got so many cool features here you know you've got your insights bit so you can see all your alerts and stuff and now as well you can even stop and start the aks cluster um so you can actually stop it to save the money uh you know because you, you the whole cluster stopped so you're not paying for anything uh, and you can start again. I think they even let you have it stop for like a year before it goes wrong. So they will keep your etcd safe for like a whole year. Um, and then you can start again. So what awesome. I did for quite a few customers, out of hours, we can shut it off, automate it. And then when they start work, start it up. Or just an hour or so before they start work, just start it up. And it's ready for them. Saves lots of money. Pay what you use, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's what you want it to be there at core times. So exactly. Wow. Well, yeah. That was an amazing yeah. session, Richard. Um, cool. I've learned a lot, as always, <laughs> to be quite honest. Bye. So uh it's been really good. Robin. Yeah, comments, awesome feedback. Uh, yeah. Awesome session, man. I love this approach of just going through it step by step and you know, talking about all the different components uh, and then you see how powerful GUI is, right? And that's mm-hmm. a really great way to start because I had a couple of times that I just started in the Terraform documentation, right? And try to uh, understand <laughs> yeah. the resource from, yeah. from there, right? And you're like, eh, this is not really working. And then you just go back doing some click offs type of things and then you're comfortable <clears> and then you automate it. But, oh man, really awesome session. Thank you, Richard. I, uh, no worries. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been awesome. Oh, awesome. So, again, go and check out Richard's LinkedIn course, right? It's, I mean, it's great. I'm seeing it across the community, especially from people with our backgrounds, right, going mm-hmm. out and doing those courses, which is great because when I watch it, like, it's, it's wired for people like myself, right? It's, it's yeah. normally quite concise and, you know, they understand the journey that we've come from, right? But it's also introducing that new, that new mindset. So go out and check out, you know, Richard's course. Again, thank you everyone for watching. If you like the show, if you like what you're seeing, please give us a like, right? Or subscribe. It tells me it tells me and Robin that we're heading in the right direction at least, right? And people are actually not, you know, not, not turning off. So, but yeah. Thanks again, Richard. All right. Thanks again, Robin. Robin, my esteemed uh, my esteemed host, and we'll uh, see you next time for Azure V1. So we're, we're going back to networking. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I'll skip that one, networking. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm actually thinking about um, working on a networking fundamentals session that I'll be hosting on this live stream. I should definitely be watching that then. We all need that, right? Keep an eye out for Mm -hmm. that. Um, Once again, thank you for watching, Richard. Thank you for attending. And uh, catch everyone later. See ya. See you now. Bye.